so much for joining us on a Sunday afternoon for Science Gallery of Bengaluru's exhibition season Psyche and the quiz Brain Freeze. So uh, we're very excited to have you all here. For those of uh, you who are new to our exhibition season, Science Gallery Bengaluru is a new institution for public engagement with research. And Psyche is our fifth digital exhibition, our uh, fifth exhibition season and the third one, which was completely digital. And uh, this exhibition season explores the complexities of the human mind. Uh, the exhibition is up till the 15th of May. So please do check out the exhibition. It's entirely online. So you can view it on your desktop or on your mobile phone. Um, I'd like to also quickly introduce the quiz master for today, Tejasvi Urupa. Uh, Tejasvi has also done a quiz with us last time for our exhibition season contagion. And we're really excited to have him back here with us for Psyche as well. Uh, Tejasvi is the chief technology officer at Roof and Flow, a digital real estate portal as a part of the Hindu group. He's also been a quizzer and quiz master for over two decades and is actively involved with the Karnataka Quiz Association. Uh, before we get in, uh, before I hand over to uh, Tejasvi to begin the quiz, I'd also just like to tell you about the rest of the programs that are there today evening. Uh, after the quiz, we have a film discussion with German filmmaker Patrick Bird and researcher Dane Isaacs about Patrick's film from over here, which is an animated film which explores stuttering. Uh, and after that, we have a lecture with Professor Sanjeev Jain from Nimhans, where he's going to talk about hysteria, the complex and convoluted persistence of an idea. So do join us. We have a lot of stuff happening this evening. Uh, before, I'd also like to encourage all of you to fill out the feedback form and let us know your thoughts about this program as well as about the exhibition. Now, I'll, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Tejasvi, and we're all looking forward to an exciting session this afternoon. Thanks, Madhu. I hope everyone can hear me clearly now. All right, let me explain how the quiz is going to work. So first, we're going to have a 25 question preliminary round, which is going to happen on this platform called WikiQuiz, which I use for most online quizzes that I conduct. I will be sharing a link on the chat window. Use that link to register yourself for this quiz using your email ID or your Facebook thing. If, if you have Gmail or Yahoo, I would recommend just using your email ID. If you are using some more obscure mailing platforms, so you may want to use the Facebook link because they tend to send the email to spam. Let me share the link with you. Once you register using that link, you're going to get a email which has another link, which is the link at which the questions are going to appear at 220 sharp. So 25 questions, you'll have 25 minutes to answer them. So the quiz preliminary is going to run from 2.20 to 2.45. And in, you'll have to answer those 25 questions in those 25 minutes. Everything is automated and timed. You don't have to submit the answers or any such thing, even though there is a submit button at the end. Whatever you have entered in those 25 minutes are what I am going to receive and what I'll use to evaluate. And based on how you perform in the prelims, the top eight will make it to the finals, which is a more uh, standard quizzing experience run of a PowerPoint presentation. So go, go to the link that's been shared on the chat window and register yourself. I'll keep sharing it every three or four minutes because people are still joining in. So the moment you register, you will receive a link in your email IDs or a Facebook notification if you use Facebook to register. Click on that link. At this point in time, all you'll see is a clock that will tell you that there are still 14 minutes to go for the quiz to start. At 2.20 precisely, the questions will automatically appear. Or you can just refresh the page at around 2.20 and you'll be able to see the questions. There are no negative markings anywhere in this quiz, so feel free to take a guess on every question. usual warnings about not googling apply i mean since it's a time thing if you're going to waste time trying to look up the answers you'll probably not get enough time to put all the answers out and a lot of times when you google and come up with answers it's fairly evident uh, because you might be answering things that the question is not asking for so when correcting i will be fake always looking at the at your answer with the lens of whether you googled for it or not so play fair the idea is that you go back after the prelims and finals with some interesting 
facts and stories that you've learned about how the human mind works or the human brain works. Let's not spoil that by using any sort of an unfair meme. I can see 16 of you have successfully registered. And there are 17 attendees right now. So there's only one person who's probably taking his time. So there's one person who's just joined as audience. So that's fine. So all 16 of you seem to have successfully registered. That's good. So you've got around 12 more minutes to go before the quiz starts. At around 2.50, 2.55, I'll be announcing who the finalists are on the Zoom session itself. So hang around, don't leave the Zoom session. One more person who just joined, the benefit of that person, please click on the link that, shared, that I just shared in the chat window and register there. Once you register, based on whether you registered using your email ID or Facebook, you'll get a email or a Facebook not notification, giving you another link, which is where the questions are going to appear. The questions will appear at 2.20 precisely. That's in 10 more minutes. All right, questions should be visible now on that link. You can just refresh the page if you don't see it already. All the best, may the best players make it to the finals. Another friendly reminder not to use any unfair means. It becomes fair, fairly obvious when you do and you tend to get caught out in the finals even if you somehow escape being caught in the prelims. All right, all the best everyone. All right, uh, I'd said I'll take eight to 10 finalists. I'm going to be generous and take 10 finalists. Let me also quickly read out the answers. Answers also will be visible to you on WikiQuiz itself, but let me also quickly read them out just in case. Uh, so the first question was about the part of the human brain that has a name, which is a hybrid of words from two different languages, Greek for new and Latin for bark or rent. This is neocortex, neo being new, and Cortex being bark. Uh, decade of the brain was a phrase used in a speech to the US Congress by George H.W. Bush or George Bush Sr. The colorful phrase here in question three is gray matter. Fourth one, which element also the title of a popular Nirvana song, this most of you got it, is lithium. Fifth one was also fairly universally answered. Uh, Household remedy for headaches because it resembles a brain. It's walnuts. Sixth one, uh, papers usually called magic number seven or magical number seven. Uh, somebody who managed to Google wrote me the entire title of the paper. But if you had read the question, all I wanted was the common three word name by which the paper is known. So people who wrote magical number seven, plus or minus two, will, are just showing that the Googling skills are good. Uh, Tower of London test is based on the Tower of Hanoi puzzle. EBC, EB stands for eye blink. Eye blinks are very commonly used in conditioning tests. Common activity that's involuntary when you're sleeping but becomes a voluntary motor function when you're awake is breathing. <laughs> a lot of people wrote urination for this. That's interesting. Osaya Carberry, uh, psycho ceramics. So ceramics should lead you to pottery and so on and psycho should hint that this is crackpot. Well done if you work that out. Next one again, a lot of you got it. That's Dunning-Kruger effect, unskilled and unaware of it. The Nimhans question, uh, there was a clue in the phrasing as well. I said probing into what? It's no speaking. That's what they won their ignoble for because they published a very well-researched report on why people tend to no speak and found out that Teenagers have a higher likelihood 
teenage males have a higher likelihood of nose picking than any other group of humans. So that's interesting, you know. Uh, component of brain that is responsible for converting short term memory into long term memory, as well as spatial memory that enables navigation. Greek word for the seahorse is hippocampus. And the related question the whole spatial memory and navigation should have helped you out. Uh, these are taxi drivers. Latin for I shall be pleasing is placebo. And in psychology, dark triad refers to narcissism, psychopathy, and Machiavellianism. I was looking for the condition and not Machiavelli. So unfortunately, those who wrote Machiavelli don't get points. 17th one seems to have stumped everyone, though one or two of you came close. Uh, this is essentially the brain in a vat thought experiment, uh, essentially saying that what if the brain is kept in a vat which will sustain it, but all the stimulus it gets is essentially from artificial means. Will the brain still think that it's an actual human being? Uh, the grandmother cell is also called as the Jennifer Aniston neuron because one you know, of the first patients where it was observed, uh, uh, only a picture of Jennifer Aniston would simulate that particular part of the brain and no other photos did. Uh, what word familiar to us from geography is this is antipode. And another Aldous Huxley question, the band I was looking for was the dose. Uh, Navon figure, if you look at too many Navon figures for a, any given length of time, the skill that in pairs is facial recognition. So because in the, when you're recognizing the face, you need to take in the face as a whole. But if you are training your brain to just look at smaller components and ignore the global aspect, uh, then you tend to fail at facial, facial recognition. Uh, the Shakespeare quote, which a few of you worked out, was some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. Anything that comes reasonably close, everyone, somebody wrote, some are born great, something, 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 greatness thrust upon them. That's more than enough for points. Uh, what part of TCNS gets its name from a Greek word for tree? Uh, accepting two answers here, because both are technically correct, a dendron or a dendrite who published the first report of what was then called presenile dementia and presenile dementia is now named after this person. This is Alzheimer. And the last one, because it looks like a star, uh, these are called astrocytes. So those were the 25 answers. Let me announce the 10 finalists as well. I request uh, Gayatri or Manu to promote them as panelists so that once they're made into panelists, we can start the finals. Uh, yes. Hem Maradia. Could you repeat that, Tejasvi? I've done that Hem one. Yeah. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah. All right, I see Hem has been made a finalist. Arun TP. Right. Shrikar Raghavan, who I think joined five minutes into the quiz, but still managed to pull out some very good answers. All right, next one is Meenakshi. You don't see Meenakshi in the list of attendees, though. Meenakshi P, right? Uh, ah, Meenakshi P, yes. Yeah, we promoted her to Bangladesh. Okay, after Meenakshi, we have Anand Kachru. Yeah. Then we have Vishak Kayappan. Vishak is not here, I think. 
All right. Let's see if he joins back at some point in time. When he does, we can. Yeah. Or Vishal, if you're here under any other name, just let us know. All right. Uh, next, we have uh, Siddharth. Yeah, done. Then we have Sai Milan. After Simon, we have Unavir. And finally, Akshay Gurumurti. Let me know once you've promoted everyone as panelists, and then we can start. By the time I explain the rules, if Vishak manages to join, we'll promote him as well. Otherwise, we'll start with just nine finalists. Uh, before we begin the finals, I request all finalists to turn on their video and keep their hands visible. Okay, Meenakshi wants to drop out apparently that's fine that's that's your choice all right which means we probably start with eight finalists and not ten all right all the finalists please uh, keep your videos on and make sure that your hands are visible on the screen Uh, let me share the screen. Let me know if you can see the screen. Waiting for Unavir to turn up because all I see is a ceiling fan, which I don't presume is going to answer questions. Siddharth, please turn your video on. Um, Unavir's back. And Anant, please turn your video on. And all finalists, you can keep your uh, keep yourself unmuted throughout. There is no pounce or anything, which means that everything is going to be on audio itself. So this will avoid you having to reach out to the computer at any point in time. Anand and Hem, uh, waiting for you guys to turn your videos on as well. Two minutes I'm joining from my laptop. I was on my phone till now for the Zoom call. All right, all right. I'll give you a couple of minutes. No worries. Um, Gayatri or Madhu will have to promote Anand as a panelist once more because he's now joined from his laptop. Done. Yeah.
All right, Anand, you can turn your video on and keep yourself unmuted. I think have everyone except Sitar seems to be missing. With that, please turn your video on and keep yourself unmuted. Uh, Siddharth, are you there? They just, I think, yeah, he's dropped off. He might be rejoining. So maybe we, okay. yeah. Give him a minute then. He, he messaged to say that he doesn't have power, so maybe we can start, and if he rejoins, we we'll just... Oh, there he's here. Oh, I'm he's back. back. Good. All right. Uh, yeah. Let me quickly go through the rules of the quiz. It's fairly simple. So, it's a quiz in two halves, much like a brain. Uh, there are 16 questions. First, we'll go clockwise for 16 questions, and then we we'll go anti-clockwise for 16 questions. It's also a kind of roughly structured in a way that the first 16 questions are directly to do with the brain or the way the mind functions and so on. The next 16 are more applied behavior kind of a thing. So more to do with how people do things in certain situations and stuff like that. Uh, we go on an infinite pounds format for those not familiar with how that works. Uh, question one will be to, let me also give the order so that I'll follow the order for the rest of the quiz as well. I'm just going to make an order based on order in which I see you guys on my screen. So Munawar, you're going to be table one. Uh, Shrikar, you'll be at two. Arun at three. Akshay at four. Saimilan at five. Aim at six, Anant at seven, and Siddharth at eight. So this is the order that we'll follow for the quiz. So in the first half, the first question will go to Munavir, and let's say he doesn't get it. We keep passing until somebody actually gives the correct answer. That person will get 10 points, and the next question will go to the person after him in that order. There is no bounce or anything, so everything happens uh, orally. 10 points for every complete correct answer, part points at my discretion. If you get somewhere reasonably close to the answer or give part of the answer, right? All right, without any further ado, let me start the clockwise half of the quiz. Munavir, this is your direct question. All the best, everyone. Like I said, keep your hands on screen throughout. Munavir, this is your question. There are two schools of thought in behaviorism. One which focuses exclusively on observable stimulus conditions and the behaviors associated with those conditions. Another which uses behavior as data, but also takes into account internal mental states to explain the behavior. In a lot of psychological literature, how are these two schools of behaviorism disambiguated? So when writing about behaviorism, given that there are two different definitions for the word, how in a lot of papers published in various psychological journals, how are the two behaviorisms disambiguated so that people know which meaning is being talked about? <clears throat> In logically work this out. You had a word with two different meanings, both of which were likely to be used. How would you try to disambiguate them? All right, Munavir, take a guess. Uh, 
algas for one they use the american english spelling and the other the british english spelling nice guess for nice two. guess but not not that shrika um okay i'll just guess uh philosophically idealism and realism something to do that no they they use the word behaviorism itself in both cases okay. but they do something else to disambiguate arun um nature versus nurture nothing to do with nature versus nurture akshay uh, the first b is upper case or lower case that's the right answer the first definition of behaviorism they write it with the capital b and the second one they write it with a small b so when people are reading they know which definition of behaviorism is being referred to in that context that's a good answer there 10 points to you uh question now moving on to simul simul this has two parts to it explain the title of this carl sagan book called the dragons of eden it's a book on the evolution of human intelligence and tell me why the cover gives a factually incorrect inter interpretation so look at the cover carefully and you can figure out something factually incorrect there and also explain the title of the book why is the book called dragons of eden All right, sir. Take a guess. I I don't have the. At least the second part should be easy. Look at the cover case for the end. The second part is related to anything belly button. No, nothing to do with belly button. Moving on to him. Uh, for the second part, I'll go that when these dinosaurs, whatever they're shown, they were there. these sort of humans mm -hmm. were there there might be a different like a more primitive form of uh, whatever this homo sapien or whatever that is and for the first part okay like uh, uh, the dragons of eden might mean the theory that we aren't descendant from monkeys or something like our earlier ancestor might have been dinosaurs which were very close to like how dragons are shown so that's why it's that so oh, understood uh, i will move on to anand uh can i get a brief of what him said because i couldn't really make out uh uh so him said the second part for the second part he said that when those dinosaurs shown on the cover were around uh the human ancestors of the sort shown on the cover weren't around so there's a uh, anachronism in the cover and for the first part he said uh, unlike uh, what the theory that humans descended from monkeys uh, there was another theory that humans descended from dinosaurs and therefore they were the dragons of eden right uh, so i don't know if this title alludes to the fact that like humans attained consciousness because they ate uh, uh, psychotic sort of a substance from uh, like like a uh, devil's apple kind of a thing i don't know maybe that is what the uh, title is alluding okay. to and for the second one i will go with what him said all right uh, moving on to siddharth uh for the second part i also agree that dinosaurs and humans didn't coexist at the same point of time i mean this particular species so there is anachronism uh mm -hmm. for the first part um you guess for the first part um i would say i'm i'm not sure but i i would go with uh, sort of saying that um sort of the forbidden fruit being a part of eden and humans sort of conquered it so that's why the dragons of eden no no nothing to do with the forbidden fruit monaver most of the same algas dragons of eden means dinosaurs and for the second part humans and dinosaurs never coexisted okay uh shrika 
Um, okay, the wrong interpretation is that apes and dinosaurs never coexisted. And the title of the book, I'll just guess, it's, it's a reference to the Greek myth of the dragon Ledon, who used to guard the golden apples, and Eden famously had these apple tree. So maybe something to do with the Greek myth. Okay, uh, no. Arun? So this is concept of the reptilian brain and the mammalian brain. Reptilian brain, brain is the instinctive part of our uh, nature, I mean, uh, behavior. Well, the mammalian brain is more thought process driven. So that could be one of How the... How does that explain the title? Uh, How does that, that explain the title? Instinctive, we are more instinctive um, than uh, we think. Uh, so, reptilian brain is the... Uh, obviously, the anachronism is there. Uh, there are multiple species. I think there, are, there is a... There is a being on the right hand side which is not even a dinosaur, it's more probably a later mammalian. Um, and these are definitely apes. Uh, and probably this tree Wait, also uh, was not, no. not part of the same. Okay, you're adding the tree also to the anachronism. No, I'll move on to Akshay. Yeah, I'll pass. Okay, Akshay passes to Sai. I think it was Sai's. I think it was Sai's. Okay, it was size direct. Okay, fine. I'll give part points to Haim, who first identified the anachronism. Uh, hominids or apes of any sort and dinosaurs of any sort never coexisted. The first part is a reference to how uh, for all early human ancestors, uh, the main reason why their intelligence evolved is that most of their time they would spend trying to fight against creatures that were much larger than themselves. And that is how across multiple culture, you have the equivalent of a dragon that's there in their mythology and everything. So he believes that having uh, that kind of a enemy, which were essentially creatures that were much creatures that were much larger and having to survive and fight against them is what led to multiple uh, cultures having myths about dragons or something close to dragons. Uh, so that's what the title alludes to. And of course, Tanakronism him got right. So he gets five points, which means Anand, you will get the next question. So some of the things that the book talks about repeatedly is something called a triune brain, concept that is now completely discredited. According to this concept, the human brain is made up of three layers that have evolved over time. What are these three layers? So triune brain was a concept that was first proposed by this guy called Edinger. It was quite popular for a long time, but in the last couple of decades, it's been discredited. So what are the three parts of a triune brain? <clears throat> okay, Anand. I really don't know. Uh, one layer that is a thinking layer, one layer that's a feeling layer, and another layer that is, uh, I don't know, um, just <laughs> I don't have a good answer. For yeah, not, not, not a bad guess at all. Uh, it's, I mean, at least logical answers. Siddha? Um, I would say that it refers to the parts of the brain that are uh, attributed for food fighting and, and sex or meeting? <laughs> no, again, good creative guess there, Munawir. Uh, based on what uh, Mr. Aron Tipi said earlier, I'll guess some amphibian, reptilian, and mammalian layers. Okay. Okay. All right, uh, Shrikar. Okay, I'll just riff on what was said earlier and say thinking, understanding, and feeling. All right, again, creative guess there, Arun. My guess is already on. <laughs> so the instincting part being the reptilian side, the logical part being the mammalian one, and the, the outermost probably is a feeling. Okay, uh, Akshay. Uh, probably like the some brain that evolved when humans were in water and then arboreal and now terrestrial. The three. Okay, non that's again a nice way of thinking about it. But no, Sai. Uh, I'm guessing uh, one one part is for the emotional and feeling and other for stimulus. Okay, uh, moving on to him. 
in pass and it was anand's direct aided by arun pp i'll give munawar five points for giving me reptilian and mammalian uh, that mammalian part is also split into two layers paleo mammalian and neo mammalian paleo mammalian being the entire uh, limbic system and the neo mammalian being what essentially is the neo cortex which only humans and apes and more evolved uh, creatures have so five points to munawar question now direct to shrikar shrikar what term did the anthropologist clifford geats play on a word seen in juridical sciences coin to describe a particular style of writing that anthropologists neuroscientists cognition sci cognition scientists etc adopted in the last few decades where by inserting themselves into the object of study they are confessing to subjectivity as opposed to objectivity in their observations um okay off the top of my head uh gonzo sciences or something like that no arun I'm going first. That was my guess. Okay, Akshay. Pass. Sai. Pass. Uh, what did you say, Sai? Pass. Pass. Okay. Uh, Kim. Ah, uh, something to do with the Rashomon. Some Rashomon. Not Rashomon. There's a big clue about the word in the juridical sciences there, which should have helped you, Anand. Pass. Okay, passing to Sita. Um, I would say something to do with vantage point or point of view, like okay. you're inserting yourself. Uh... Nice guess. It's not a bad guess, Munawar. I'll guess habeas corpus. not habeas corpus but at least that's from juridical sciences the on juridical on. phrase i was looking for was eyewitness and right. the play on word is he changed eyewitness to eyewitness eye, eye being witness uh, by eye and he calls the style as eyewitnessing because whenever presenting a case study they talk about their perspectives about what they felt and everything which in earlier scientific papers was not done very often Uh, but the cool arcade, the arcade gaming or something like that because coin I saw the word coin and then insert so. Okay. Alright. Uh, Arun, you're direct now. Science writer John Horgan called behavioral genetics as essentially which earlier science stripped for the most part of its unsavory political tendencies. Again, easily workoutable behavioral genetics. Think of an earlier science, which had a lot of unsavory political aspects. Eugenics. Eugenics is right. Well done. That's ten points to you. Direct now to Akshay. Staying with John Horgan, he has written that neuroscience and associated fields suffer from something called a Humpty Dumpty dilemma. What is this Humpty Dumpty dilemma? You can work this out if you remember the Humpty Dumpty story. Uh, yeah, I'll say that maybe neuroscience just got split into so many subfields, and it's, it it's just like way too focused instead of like giving a bigger picture kind. Of. i'll actually give it to you uh, so, so essentially what has happened is that various studies have in the last few decades they managed to go into minute details of very specific aspects but nobody is really able to explain the brain as a whole so everybody is talking of one very specific aspect uh, which is more or less close enough to what you said so you can take your points uh, that's 10 points to you and sai you will get the next direct what science and science i put in quotes has been by its critics pejoratively described as the odd treating the id can work this out I 
I don't right. have taken it. Yes. No, okay. Uh, name? Psychology. Not psychology. Not a bad guess though, Anand. Uh, is it like uh, some sort of or some manner of forensic psychology, the kind that you would see on shows like Mindhunter? Not yes. forensic psychology, Siddha. Uh, I was also thinking of saying psychology, but I would go with, uh, I don't know, clinical psychology. Not clinical psychology, Munave? I guess psychiatry. Not psychiatry either, Shrikar. Uh, I guess the numero psychology. Not numero psychology. We are hearing various versions of psychology except the right answer, Arun. Um, is it um, uh, paranormal psychology? Oh, Akshay. Psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis, so one, is, right? It, oh. it was something that Freud is yeah. famously associated with. Uh, well worked out. You looked at the right word there to work this out. So the odd treating the head is essentially psychoanalysis. And of course, psychoanalysis isn't much of a science despite having the word analysis there. Sai, you again get the next direct. To come to an answer about the nature versus nurture debate, what set of subjects did Francis Galton extensively study? Again, you can logically work this out. Uh, is it uh, related to cuckoo, cuckoo bird? Not cuckoo birds. Uh, came. Prisoners? Not prisoners either. Anand? Like orphans? Like or and like kids who grew up in foster care homes? Uh... No, not orphans. Nice guess. Uh, Siddharth? I think we lost it. That must be our issues. Okay, we'll move on to Munavi. Immigrants. Not immigrants. Uh, Shrikar. I say pets. Not pets either. Arun? Twins or siblings who have been separated and given to different parents. I'll take your first answer and give it to you. Identical twins is right. So it's uh, and in specifically identical twins who had different, he, he forcibly, when the twins were born, he would forcibly separate them and uh, bring them up in different circumstances and then see how their uh, behavior changed. Uh, that's 10 points to you. Well worked out. Akshay, you get the next direct. What observation led to Aristotle ruling out the brain as the body's control center? Uh, it, it's an observation that he made in a particular animal, not humans. Maybe while killing some animal, uh, he saw that the heart was still beating after the death. So he assumed it should be the heart as opposed to. Okay, uh, good guess. Uh, Sai? Uh, I think he might have observed other organs for working even after. Uh, sorry, repeat that. Uh, you might have observed that uh, organs were working still uh, some time after the brain was removed. Ah, okay, understood, understood. No, him. Is this a lizard? Like the tail still flips even after. Uh, one uh, very second? nice guess. Very nice guess, but no, this wasn't a lizard that he saw. Anand. Is it that like after decapitating a chicken, they can still walk around for a while? That is the perfect uh, answer. So when you decapitate the chicken, they still run around. And he saw that and said, okay, fine. Clearly, chickens don't need brains to run around. So that's 10 points to Anand. Well worked out. Siddharth, you're back and you get the next direct. Yes. So we are more likely to come across the Latin and English versions of this. The philosopher originally wrote it in French as Chopin's Dong Chesui. 
give me the two more familiar versions with whatever little french you know to work it out and give me the latin and the english versions that we are more familiar with i am i think therefore i am okay the english version and, and the latin version latin? is uh i have no idea about at um i i don't know any latin to even try this so i'm going to stick to that all right okay munavil i think therefore i am and cogito ergito sum five cogito oh. ergo sum not ergito sum but i'll give it to you anyway and five points to you siddhar for translating it accurately pens also gives rise to words like pencil and everything in english so even the knowledge of english you could have kind of figured that it had something to do with thinking uh question now direct to shrikar shrikar both the words orangutan and chimpanzee share the same meaning in their native languages showing that humans can think like even when not sharing the language what do both these words mean hairy beast hairy beast nice guess good accurate description but that's not what either translates to arun man of the forest or man of the jungle that is the perfect answer well done both of them essentially that mean man who lives in the forest because that's the only context those guys saw these creatures in and they look close enough to humans to for them to think that they're actually humans akshay you get the next tire give me the three word phrase most commonly associated with this diagram phrase was originally coined by hickel and pretty much every evolutionary scientist popularized this phrase very well known phrase in darwinism Pre-Cambrian. Okay. No. Uh, moving on to Sai. Uh, I don't remember. So I'll say survival fittest. Not survival of the fittest. Him. Pass. Okay, you pass the Anand. Origin. Not origin of species either. Siddha. uh ontogeny over phylogeny or ontogeny phylogeny i will see if munavir can give me something better what did he say he said ontogeny precedes phylogeny or ontogeny over phylogeny those were the two versions he gave ontogeny of the fetus <laughs> no he just made up a fish shrikar ah yeah this ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny that is the correct phrase uh, essentially phylogeny is a repetition of what the ontogeny is uh, and that's the concept that this diagram shows across all different creatures you see that phylogeny actually recapitulates the origin of how those uh, species evolved uh i'll give siddhar five points for his memory of the two key words in it but forgetting the word in the middle question now direct to arun arun uh, michael sukhian chwe author of jane austen game theorists wrote an article in the new york times about the dangers of confirmation bias in science article was titled scientific blank and blank sorry blank 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 fill in the blanks with the title of an appropriate 1813 novel Pride and prejudice. Pride and prejudice is right. There's Jane Austen. There's confirmation bias. So, and I kind of blurted out and also, but you would have worked it out 
anyway i guess so, akshay you are direct coming up all right that's a poster of this documentary called project nim and uh, just pasted whatever was written on the blurb of the dvd so it's about a chimpanzee that learned to communicate with language and was raised and nurtured like a human child and the documentary is about the enduring impact that nim makes on all the people that he meets my question is after whom is the chimpanzee nim named uh, non chomsky yeah, noam chomsky is right the full name of the chimpanzee is nim chimsky Chimps. uh, given that noam chomsky had a lot of theories about language uh, and given that whole point of raising this chimp was to make it learn language was named after him 10 points to you question now to sai This is a 1970s TV series called the X Y Y Man, mirroring a commonly held belief of that area, that that era, something that has since been proved to be false. So, what was the premise of X Y Y Man? Uh. Any additional chromosome were given. Uh, sorry, what did you say? Uh, I am thinking of the chromosomes, but I don't know. I don't know yeah, what. I try and work it out from there. You're you're thinking along the right track, but tell me more. No, I don't. Okay, moving on to him. Is this some chromosome theory X Y Y? Like this person is homosexual. There was a theory before that this is how the chromosomes um, are supposed to be. But then... no, chromosomes don't impact your sexuality or sexual orientation. Anna. Uh, that uh, like uh, you could implant a woman's brain into a man's and change their behavior no interesting premise too maybe sh- someone should make a series on that siddha uh is it something to do with the alpha male because there's an extra y chromosome or a that male is the male? right answer there was a commonly held belief that people men with an extra y chromosome tend to be more male more violent mm-hmm. and more strong and so on and so forth that that was the premise well worked out that's 10 points to you and question now to munave it's from a dilbert panel i have blanked out a two word phrase uh, what theory that holds that when people hold contradictory beliefs for example i'm a rational autonomous person yet i just did something pointless They experience an unpleasant state, which they mitigate by bringing one of the beliefs into consistency with the other. This theory was first put forth by somebody called Leon Festinger. You can work it out from the panel as well and from the text that I have provided. Right, take a guess. Uh, imposter syndrome. Not imposter syndrome, Shrika. Um, um, something dissonance or uh, dissonance matching, but. Okay, moving on to Arun. Um, it's like the post-coital embarrassment. No post-coital <laughs> embarrassment. Akshay, thinker's dilemma. What thinker's dilemma? Sai. I don't know. Okay, aim. Pass. 
uh, Hame also passes to Anand. Is it the IKEA effect? Not the IKEA I effect. Is it that? Cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is oh. right. She has moved around the answer, but hmm? sorry, somebody said something. No, no, no. I thought it was already said. She could hover around the answer. I was hoping that somebody would catch on and complete it. Actually, the price it came up to me. All right, Punavid, you again get the next direct. Oh, wait. We are, that's the end of the clockwise half, the right half. So let me quickly take a look at the scores at this point. Munavir, you're on 15. Shrikar, you're on 10. Arun, on 40. Along with Takshay, who's also on 40. Sai hasn't opened his account yet. Haim is on 5. Anant is on 10. And Siddharth is on 30. So quite close at the top. Anybody can win this. Uh, 16 more questions. Then we go anti-clockwise, which is we start with Siddharth and go in the other direction. So Siddharth, your direct coming up. <clears throat> While this two-word term has existed since the 18th century, its present currency is from a 1970s anthology titled The Black Woman by Tony Kate. New branch of linguistics called euphemism treadmill emerged in the 1980s thanks to feminists and intellectual groups who decided to rephrase terms that were otherwise offensive. In Britain, some schools altered popular nursery rhymes to reflect this new idea. What is the two-word term that I'm talking about? That was introduced by Tony Kate in the 1970s. And it's a new branch of linguistics, take it very lightly. It's not an actual branch. Just to is it. Freudian slip or something Freudian cycle. Freudian slip. Anand? Tide washing? No. Pain? Pass. Passing to side? Pass. Akshay? Black sheep? No. Arun? Pink washing? No. Shrikar? Uh, dumb blonde. Not dumb blonde either. Munavir? <clears throat> whitewashing. No, somebody already said whitewashing. It was much simpler than all of that. It was looking for political correctness. That's the phrase that was introduced by Tony Cade in the 70s, which then led to a lot of phrases and words being changed. Uh, Anand, you get the next direct. Shown in the visual are the Karaites, who were attendants of the goddesses Aphrodite and Hera in Greek myth. They were goddesses of a lot of things like grace, beauty, adornment, mirth, festivity, dance, and so on. The idea of using the name to describe leadership, authority, and domination was introduced by Max Weber. What word or idea that Weber used to describe Hitler's rule comes essentially from this group of goddesses called the Karaites. <laughs> The Reich, as in the Third Reich? No, Reich is just German for rule. Came? Three Muses? No. Shai? No. Okay, uh, that sounded like a pass. Akshay? Uh, fates? No. Uh, Arun. Uh, perfect situation. Like the perfect situation or something. Like that. That's my. Perfect that. situation. Is that what you said? Yeah. No. Shrikar? Pass. Or did you pass? Yeah, yeah, pass. Okay. Munavir? Uh, cult of personality. Nice guess. Uh, you all missed out on a... Oh, wait. Siddharth, you still haven't taken a guess. Uh, yeah. 
is it something to do with aryan race or aryan superiority i think to do with aryan uh, all, all of you missed out on the fact that it derives from the name karaites you should have thought of a word that comes from that this is charisma uh, oh. quite close to cult of personality and everything but the word that max weber used to describe hitler's leadership style is charisma which then the word charisma weber. comes from these goddesses uh, uh hey you get the next direct the spinal cord ends in a tuft of spinal nerves that looks like this its name is the latin phrase for what it resembles so give me the latin name of this part of the central nervous system you can figure out what it resembles and then use your latin skills to come up with a phrase if you just give me the english thing i will give you part points right hey uh, it resembles a root so some fibros or something okay moving on to side Sai, what's your guess? Uh, uh, any no nodules? No, not nodules. Akshay. Carnal nerves. No, Arun. Ganglia and they resemble nodes and nodules and roots. Ganglia. No, Shrikar. I was going to say ganglia as well. Okay, you have an alternate guess. Ah, no pa. Munavir. Oda ikoina. Corda equina, which literally means horse's tail, is correct. It looks like a horse's tail. And Latin for horse's tail is corda equina. <laughs> That's a good ten points to you, Munawar. Question now goes to Siddhar. So that for a long time stickers were used. However, recently to prevent cheats, who would just peel the stickers off and swap them as needed, a version was launched where everything was color molded. What artifact often used in a lot of tests of intelligence and problem solving skills am i talking about uh, it's a test of intelligence sir uh, stickers it is in its it's it, the artifact is commonly used to test problem solving skills and so on is it holograms not a hologram of any sort anna uh this is it uh like how on answer sheets you would have a qr code uh, pasted uh, but now nothing to do with any qr code of any sort hey rubik's cube rubik's cube is right as simple as that so people figured out a simple way of solving the rubik's cube was to remove all the stickers and then put them in the right order so now now the rubik's cubes that you get are actually color molded so you can't do any of that Good answer there, Hain. Sai, you get the next direct. This shows the components of a Stroop task, a tool that was used by American intelligence officials during the Cold War to suss out Russian agents. All you need to do is explain how this works. Uh, in Russian, uh, green and blue are uh, similar. They have uh, there is no distinction between the colors there. Yeah. Uh, what you say about the russian language is true but this that has nothing to do with the stroop task moving on to akshay so basically they would be asked to just read out the color the idea being that if you can actually understand the letters then you would read what the letters are and not just the color like if i can read cyrillic i would read green instead of the red colored which is written so a russian agent would know cyrillic and would get caught out that is the right answer well done That's ten points to you. Question now to Arun. Uh, so, the way Chinese language works is when they come across any new thing, they essentially uh, make up a word for it by referring it to something that they already know. 
For example, the Chinese name for a walrus literally translates to ocean elephant. Therefore, now work out what creatures have Chinese names that literally translates to ocean panther and ocean piglet. Shark and dolphin. Uh, what and dolphin? Sharks. Sharks. S H A R. Shark. Uh, moving on to whose turn is it? Oh, so you, you moved the answer. You showed the answer. Oh, sorry. My bad. Okay, I'll just give part points to uh, Arun who said dolphin, which is right. Seal was the other one. My bad on that. I think I accidentally clicked on the next thing there while trying to see whose turn it was next. Uh, Shrikar, you'll get the next direct. Sorry about that. Stickers showing these symbols, literally Shoshinsha and Koresha, are found on vehicles on Japanese roads and serve as some sort of a warning. Well, the Shoshinsha has an equivalent in most countries, including India, where it has even found its way into local slang to indicate inexperience or ineptitude. The Koresha does not. What do these two symbols indicate? Um, so indicate inexperience or inexperience is probably uh, learners uh, like LR or something like that. That would show you. Okay. And what, just what about Koresha? Um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's to say you've been in an accident before or something like that. Nice. Interesting. I mean, that definitely would require a warning. Unavir? Uh, first one, I'll guess the same thing, uh, what L means in India. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the second part, I'll guess people whose uh, license have been suspended in the past and they got it again. Got it. Good guess, but no, Siddha. Uh, I would say the first one is for the learners thing where you're still learning. And the second one is you have a medical condition which puts you at risk for... Um, ah, sort nice, of guess, nice guess again. Yeah. Anand? So the uh, first one is the same. The other one is for old people. That is the correct answer because old people tend to be not the greatest drivers. So it's always good to have a warning that the driver is aged. And of course, uh, five points to Shrikar who got the elbow equivalent right off the bat. Question now to him. Five points to me as well, right? <laughs> huh? Five points to me as well, right? Yeah. Uh, hey, if you've been around Bangalore, you'd see a lot of flyover pillars and underpass walls having these kind of patterns painted on them. What's the reason? So it's basically in the night, if there's a driver who is driving very close to this, this basically act like a cat sign which are put on the road. So they can, with their headlights, they Got can it. figure out if there's a pillar or not something. Nice guess, but no. Sai? Uh, I had the same guess as well. In the night. Okay. Nothing, no, nothing to do with visibility for drivers. Akshay? Uh, maybe because this looks beautiful, people would be disincentivized to like spit pan or urinate around them and maintain uh, the. Right. There are some things that you can't change. I think people will still do it. Arun? Um, if you stick posters on this, the poster won't stick out very great because this is more bright than the posters. So. That is the perfect answer. So you create such a lot of visual noise on it that any poster that you put on it won't really be made out at all. So that disincentivizes people from sticking gap posters on it. Well worked out. That's a good 10 points to you. And question now to Shrikar. Shrikar, uh, back to Japan and two kinds of things in Japan again. There are two different kinds of knots used to tie gifts. Which knot is used depends on the occasion for the gifting. Weddings and funerals, for example, you should gift with a musubikari, which means tied completely. And for birthdays, graduation ceremonies, etc., you should gift with chomosubi, which means butterfly knot. Compare and contrast these two knots. 
what, what's the whole logic of having two different kinds of knots for wrapping gifts um okay i'll guess the butterfly knot is easy to pull you can just do it once and it will open and the mm -hmm. idea is you open it immediately or something like that but the other one it's harder to open so it means you go back and open it once you get home or in privacy or something like that got it N nice nice try munal uh a similar first one maybe for older people second for younger people <laughs> no this, this is not a old young question again coming back in another form siddharth uh i would say the butterfly knot symbolizes temp uh, temporality and uh, the complete knot is more permanent which is what marriage and that signifies and versus birthdays and graduation which is a step to something better and improving <laughs> very logical very logical guess but not right anand i had something similar like weddings and funerals they're emphasizing the finality like may your wedding you know uh like may your marriage last forever and like for a butterfly and not emphasizing that oh uh, look this will grow from this to something else like from a few parts you, you just kind of repeated what uh, siddharth yeah, said slightly like different know. words him uh so i'm assuming butterfly knot is mostly for kids like young people so it's easier for them to even make the knot if they are going to their friends birthday party but where like your wedding knots and all are for experienced people who people who have some experience of giving gifts so that's why more complex knot you are giving another version of old and young guest by munawir him or oh, sorry it was you sai so i'm guessing birthday repeat so these uh, chumps to be are tied so many times and wedding must be only done once so this may be only for the special occasion type that that is the distinction that i was looking for i'll give part points to shikar who kind of established the concept of easy to untie versus tough to untie but it's about one time only versus repeats multiple times in occasions that you want many repeats of that's one that's the one that you will love <laughs> use the easier to untie lot so sai opens his account now with this well worked out answer akshay you get the next direct in late 19th century turkey alcohol was easily available as long as it met a certain constraint made possible by what can at best be termed as liberal reading of the quran what was the constraint it's there in this quiz because this falls under what's usually called as the rationalization that you do of bad things when you want to do things you'll just rationalize it some way saying that yes this is the reason why i'm doing it and that's what turkish people did okay, i'll say uh, as long as it was uh, i mean wherever it was fertilized was in like a holy place or something ah uh, no Arun, as long as it is made from fermented uh, animal products like milk or something like that, other than no, nothing to do with animal products. Shrika, um, I'd say as long as it is re red in color because blood. No, nothing to do with color. Munawir, uh, I guess as long as it was not made from grapes, because I think that's what mentioned in Quran. I will give it to you. So. the back during when the quran was written the only alcohol was essential available was essentially wine which was made from various fruits and not just grapes that versions of things made from other fruits as well so the turkish logic was that given that quran only mentions those things if we drink any other alcohol it's fine because the quran doesn't talk about it so that's the rationalization done that's uh, 10 points to munawir and uh, siddharth you will get the next question by laying down its railway tracks why did russia take a decision to use a gauge different from what was being used in the rest of europe it's kind of relevant now as well uh 
they wanted to ensure that uh, only the railway tracks they were using were being manufactured in their own country and they did not trade it with other people that it was manufactured elsewhere no anand so perhaps the logic that they used was that in case of an invasion like any foreign country would not be able to utilize their infrastructure for bringing in uh, arms supply that, that will give you points so russia could easily transport its troops to its borders quickly but a train with foreign troops would not be able to roll into russia well worked out that's 10 points to you and same you get the next direct okay uh, what you see on top is the complete credited cast of a particular movie and at the bottom this is still show so based on these two tell me which movie this is also using these two images work out why the bottle is called the fregoli what are the two images the cast and yeah. first image on top is the complete credited cast of a certain movie bottom image is a screenshot from the movie and you can see that the hotel in this movie is called the fregoli why is the name the fregoli appropriate all right him uh Uh, okay, so this movie is some some movie on Freud and his daughter. I don't remember the name and Fregoli because maybe Freud clinic was called Fregoli or in some Fregoli area. No, I. I don't have any guess. Okay, Akshay. I'll pass. Uh, passing to Arun. Um. there are no actors in this uh, like visual actors in this movie everything is a voice and uh, this is the only uh, and the entire movie is set in uh, in this hotel no nothing to do with that shikar um tell this say it's only voice the whole movie is about voices in someone's head and that's why freud comes in freud oh? no no oh, freud in in this munave And the film is Anomalisa, hmm? and this comes from I think Fregoli syndrome. In this film, everyone basically looks the same to the lead character. That is the perfect answer. Anomalisa is also called as the Fregoli delusion, where essentially it's a mental disorder where everybody looks and sounds exactly the same. Ma, which is why you can see that uh, this Tom Noonan is playing everybody else's voice except. Uh, one character because uh, Jennifer Jason Leigh is also narrating the movie so she has a different voice and uh, David Tulis's character just hears and sees everybody as the same and uh, that condition is called anomalisa which is also called as fregoli fregoli delusion named after the scientist who discovered it that's a good 10 points there to manavil why is the hotel called the fregoli because yes. another name for anomalisa is fregoli delusion okay this is named after Okay. And for how many questions are left? I think uh, there are totally sixteen, so probably some two or three more at least. All right. Most familiar to us is the first part of a longer word. It's a German word that means learning and education, but also implies a cultivation of the self and of maturity. It was a concept central to a lot of Goethe's writing, which in turn made it central to German culture of that time. What is the seven-lettered word that I am looking for? So it's a question to me, right? Just checking. This is a question to Sida. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, is it Wissen, as in Wissen or Wissen shop? No, Anand. Uh, is it a buildings roman coming of age kind of uh, so if that is that what's the what's this word read read the question carefully oh boyhood is it like are you is that the word that you're looking no, for no, i'm I, sorry i need a german word only
is it not bildungs roman is that <laughs> that is clearly not a seven lettered word okay 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 Is it this building? Uh, <laughs> that is what I was waiting for you to say. I'm <laughs> waiting for you. <laughs> we all know it as part of a larger word, building stroma, but the concept is just build hook. I mean, I didn't want to move on because you pretty much given the answer. It would be unfair to not give you points. So I was hoping you would say building at some point. Well done. Ah, uh, hey, you get the next direct. A fake smile, one where only the zygomatic major muscle voluntarily contracts to show perfunctory politeness, has a couple of nicknames. So we we all tend to do this when we just we don't want we are not actually feeling happy, but we just smile because we are supposed to smile. So one such name is named after a defunct airline whose flight attendants were known for such fake smiles. The other is named for a substance excessive use of which can cause paralysis of small muscles around the eyes. Which therefore impacts on natural smile. Give me both nicknames. Is there a timeline on the airline being defunct, or is it like it's been defunct for a couple of decades? More than a couple of decades. What couple of? A couple of decades. Decades. Been defunct for a long time. Alright, hey. Yeah. Also, the airlines I'll go with TWA, Trans Western Airlines, and substance is glycerin. Okay. Ah, uh, Sai. Uh, airlines is Pan Am. Uh, substance, hmm? I'll say glycerin as well. Okay. Ah, uh, moving on to Arun. Panam and Botox. That is the full answer. Panam smile and the Botox smile. Five points to Akshay who said Panam and full ten points to Arun. And most likely the last or last but one question goes to Shrika. Because of high infant mortality rates north of the wall, it's considered a bad omen to do something among the free folk in G R R Martin's. Song of Ice and Fire. The television adaptation does not pay heed to this convention with the one child of the three folk that we do see, which is Gilly's kid Sam. What is it that the three folk do not do with their kids? Um, snip off the umbilical cord completely. No, Munavir. Uh, Naming children. That is the right answer. You don't name children until they grow up because you don't know whether they'll survive into adulthood or not. But Gilly's kid Sam is named right at the outset. That's ten points to you. Let's see if we have. Ah, uh, we do have more questions. Ah, uh, this is to Siddharth. For many decades, a lot of men in Western Africa would get perfectly healthy teeth, painfully, given that this is not done by a dentist with access to anesthesia, pulled out. Why were they doing so? Uh, it was the initiation into sort of adulthood or manhood. No, this is not a coming of age ritual. Anand. Uh, so this would sort of symbolize like how how much pain they could take, and like that would be sort of a symbol for. Uh, no. Uh, uh, him. I guess perfectly. It was used in some sort of African medicine, so they didn't. I don't like any case. Okay, Akshay. Uh, I'll say the white teeth they pulled out was sold as fake ivory. Or oh no, Arun. Uh, I'm just guessing that uh, they would take off their incisors, uh, the main teeth, but they would keep retain the others because they used to hold their uh, camels. What do you call it? Very, they, very intriguing guess, but no, Shrika. Um, for some reason, there was this fat to get a gold teeth implanted. No, Munawir. 
algas and slave owners did this uh, because they can't cut their ropes with their teeth anymore and escape ah interesting munavir was the only person who came close is to it, the is it because they don't get the not by slaves yeah, what are slaves that oh. is the right answer it's ah. to reduce their value in the slave market because most common way of determining the worth of a slave was by the condition of the teeth and the toothless man would be seen as unhealthy and likely to die soon and they would not be bought so post facto somebody did get it but unfortunately no one gets points on it and that is the end of the quiz all right so final scores sa uh, coming in eighth today is sai with 10 points but he did get one very good answer right came comes in seventh at 15 shikar on sixth at 20 siddharth comes fifth with 30 anant comes fourth with 40 Tying for the second spot is Akshay Gurumurthy and Muhammad Bunawer. Both of you got fifty-five, but with one crucial answer about Botox, so pulling into the lead and cementing his first place is Arun TP, who gets sixty-five points. So, congrats, Arun, Akshay, and Bunawer, and well played, everyone else. Hope you guys had a lot of fun during the quiz. I, I definitely enjoyed setting the questions. Really good. Thanks, sir. The very nice quiz. Yeah, it was very fun. Yeah. Very well. Thank you. Thanks, Tejasvi, uh, and congratulations, uh, Arun. That was uh, that was quite fun. I knew quite a few answers, and I just wanted to kind of jump in <laughs> and say something. <laughs> Good that you did. <laughs> no, but it was really cool. Uh, very cool questions, and I think we all learned some uh, very interesting. Um, facts fun facts today around the brain and the mind and uh, around human behavior i think also so that was really uh, interesting so thanks everyone again who joined us if you missed uh, watching some of the quiz and you want to see it the event will be up on our youtube channel or you can always check out our previous events as well on our youtube channel uh, next week we have a lecture by john carson type and title can the mind be measured intelligence and its quantification so if you are interested in that please do join in and we are also going to be releasing the results of our live experiment perspectives on news events so you can join in for that as well i'd like to ask the audience and all our participants to share their feedback on the event in the link in the feedback or the link for the feedback form which is given in the chat and do sign up for the other programs and visit the exhibition before it closes on the 15th of may so um thank you so much tejasvi it was a wonderful session for a sunday afternoon thank you again to all the participants for joining us have a good weekend everyone all right see you everyone